When I was talking before, I was talking about the fight at Hougamont Farm and how we could actually tell that story through the archaeology and the discoveries that we could make. And a crucial ingredient that was missing was the people who actually fought at the battle. Could we find any traces of them? Well, apart from the old musket ball, which you'd expect maybe come winging over the walls and actually landing in the, uh, in the farm itself, could we actually find any traces of the people who were there? Now, the second year we dug our ex uh, excavations in the, within the barn, one of my diggers actually found a button and when we cleaned it up we found that it was a button of the Coldstream Guards. We could not believe how important, how excited we were to find that button. There was also a very very fine twist of wire. I didn't know what it was. I'm an archaeologist. I'm not a military historian, but we had enough military people around us who said, I know what those are. It's the silver wire braid off of an epaulette. Could well be an officer's uniform that we're dealing with. We were incredibly buoyed up by that. And over the years, particularly last year, after four years of excavating, the amount of buttons that came from one corner of the trench increased by leaps and bounds. But it got better. There was one day I was, I was, I was working in the trench and I observed one of my diggers and I thought, what's he up to? So I went over and had a look. And by the side of where he was working, there was this green thing in the bottom of the trench. Now, green is not a very archaeological colour. It usually means one thing, copper, copper alloy. And I bent down and I recognised it was a button. And more importantly, it had something underneath it. It was like a pair of uh, two halves of a nut. And I stopped him from working and we cleaned it up and we photographed it, and we recorded where we were finding it. These are all incredibly boring things that archaeologists have to do before you can actually take it out of the ground. But where does this come from is such an important element of understanding archaeology. Finally, I was able to lift it out of the ground, and I had an, uh, a soldier with me. It was a cold streamer who knows his buttons and he was so excited until he saw the design on it. It was a Scots Guards button. Uh, how did you feel? <laughs> how did you feel? Wow! <laughs> so does that mean if it is Scots Guards we've got two? Yeah, yeah. Yeah that's 100% Scots Guards. You see the that's going to be two Scots isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, we knew that the Scots Guards were at Hougamont Farm and actually formed part of the garrison at Hougamont Farm. But this was such an exciting breakthrough, particularly for people like me. I must confess it didn't go down too well with the cold streamers who thought they were the only power on God's earth who had ever actually fought at Hougamont Farm. And over the, the following few days, it was swings and roundabouts as to whether or not we were actually going to get more Coldstream buttons than Scots Guards buttons or the other way around. Either way, what we're doing is adding an incredible detail to the story and more importantly it begins to actually make us possible to reach out to the people who fought in that garrison. Now, here's an interesting bit. While we were there, I was due to read this at our annual reading for remembrance where we, we actually relate descriptions of the battle for the entire duration of the battle on one day during our dig. And here's my letter. I had a letter from, it was written by Ensign Thomas Wedgwood of the Scots Guards. It was a letter to his mother and it was dated the 19th of June 1815, the day after the battle. 
and he wrote to his mother, there was a house, that's Hougamont Farm, surrounded by a small wall in which were placed the light infantry companies of the Coldstream Guards and our regiment, Scots Guards, with orders to defend it to the last. The French were driven back, but advanced again with a fresh force and succeeded in gaining entrance into the wood. There was a wood just in front of Hougamont Farm. Now then, they then sent fireballs upon the house and set a barn and all the outhouses on fire. That barn was the barn that I was actually digging up. After being exposed to a heavy fire of shot and grape and shells for two hours and a half, in which we had three officers wounded beside a number of men, the right wing of our regiment and my company went to the assistance of the cold streams in the wood in which there was a very heavy fire of musketry. The French were during the whole of this time at the house into which my company and another entered. So the Scots Guards are actually going in to Hougamont Farm. Nearly 100 men having now been consumed in the flames. The fire that we were actually finding archaeological traces of in our excavations. The French forced the gates three times and three times were driven back with immense loss, for we were firing at one another at about five yards distance. That sort of detail combined with our archaeological discoveries helps to bring the whole storyline together and actually helps to give us a paint a picture of what life was like during the battle at Hougamont Farm. Later on, he says, my regiment had lost 16 officers killed and wounded, including Lieutenant Colonel Sir A. Gordon and Canning of my company, who were among the number of killed. Captain Ashton of my company is also killed. Now, knowing full well that we've actually found traces of an officer's uniform in that barn, and that the Scots Guards were there, I can't help but wonder whether or not Wedgwood actually knew those individual officers. I tend to think that there's a good chance that he may well have done. And when you're an archaeologist, that's an incredibly powerful message or vision that you can get. Making out contact with people who lived and wrote about the battle, but actually finding the remains in the archaeology.